Wagner and Fuchida joined forces while Vorsheim went with the others. Now Fuchida took another important step. For the first time, the League sought the cooperation of the Japanese Christian community, and through this contact, Fuchida came to know the Protestant Church. Before this, he hadn't set foot in a Christian house of worship, except for the Osaka Cathedral. He had been evangelizing for Christ unbaptized and had never attended a Christian religious service. The Protestant Church was a great discovery. He loved the unassuming eloquence of the sermon, the simple, tuneful hymns, the atmosphere of reverence and peace within the building. What impressed him most was the fellowship among the church goers, particularly the younger people and teenagers. How kind they were to me and to one another, how pure, honest and unselfish, he exclaimed. They were a refreshing antidote to some of Japan's post-war youth who disgusted him. It was so bad in some cases it was unbelievable, declared Fuchida. In Hokkaido it dawned on him that there had been a void in his Christian life. So when the time came to leave for a two-week vacation, he told Wagner that he had decided not to join them. I want and need the Fellowship of Christ as a member of his church, he explained. I'm going back to Kashiwara to join the Christian church in Osaka. Wagner heard him out and agreed that it was the right thing to do. Still, Fuchida left Hokkaido filled with misgivings. The island was woefully weak in both defence and morale. The new police reserve had neither weapons, training, nor spirit. They were really only a paper force, he recalled. I was grieved that my homeland, once so strong and secure, should now be so weak, and that it had to depend for its protection and security on the United States. How much better it would have been if the Japanese themselves could have protected Japan. Shortly after he reached Kashiwara, the information that the United States had sent two divisions into Hokkaido relieved his fears for that island's safety. But it offended his pride and sense of fitness that Americans should risk their lives to protect his homeland. He pointed out, however, that some Japanese did help in the Korean War effort. To take one example, MacArthur and his admirals needed expert navigational assistance for the Incheon landing because of the treacherous tides in that area. As the Japanese knew these tides well, the Americans asked for a number of pilots and navigators to assist. About 50 of Fuchida's former colleagues participated. After the Incheon landing, many small Japanese boats became transports plying the waters between Japan and Korea. To Fuchida, such incidents were a source of keen gratification. The Japanese-American relationship had moved beyond that of guardian and child into partnership, however one-sided. Fuchida returned to his farm to face another war, one within himself. He had reached a crossroads. He needed and wanted to be a member of a Christian community such as he had known in Hokkaido, but church membership carried a price. If he became a baptised Christian, he must give up Kimi, and that would not be easy. He worried over little Yoko. What would become of her if her father bowed out of her life? In anguish, he took the problem to the only person he knew wise and kind enough to understand, Haruko. She listened silently as he stammered out his story and explained his dilemma. When he had finished, she raised her head and said simply, I will accept your child. Bring her home. This would have been the ideal solution. Yoko would have a full family life, the best education Fuchida could afford, the companionship of a brother and sister, and a good mother too. Haruko would never take out on a child the distress her husband had caused her, but in Kimi Fuchida was not dealing with a woman capable of assessing what was best for her daughter. Emotion ruled her. She considered herself Fuchida's wife and never accepted his decision to break with her. She refused to give up Yoko. She loved her, and no doubt obscurely felt that with her daughter by her side, Fuchida might come back. Yoko grew up knowing that Mitsuo Fuchida was her father, but Kimi never told her that Fuchida had a wife and legitimate children. Hence the girl couldn't understand why her father didn't visit her and her mother, confining his contact to occasional letters and postcards. Having broken with Kimi in October 1950, Fuchida joined the Sakai Church in Osaka. Although the nearest Christian church to his home, it was an hour and a half from Kashiwara by electric car. The minister, Reverend Toshio Saito, became one of his best friends and a spiritual father to him. During that fall and winter, Haruko attended services with him every Sunday, although she was still a Buddhist. 
She sat in the congregation on Easter Sunday morning, 25th March 1951, when Reverend Saito baptised her husband. His parting with the Pocket Testament League had been friendly, but Fuchida would never have recommended that other new converts plunge immediately into evangelism. An evangelist, he came to believe, should be someone who had had plenty of practice witnessing for Christ by following a good life, and who worked up gradually to intensive public campaigns. Then his testimony to large audiences would be clear and triumphant. After his baptism, Fuchida gave personal testimony anywhere people expressed interest in hearing him. These appearances carried him all over Nara and the surrounding prefectures. Haruko often went along and watched him closely, as if judging just how deep this reformation went. Soon it became obvious that he was sincerely trying to lead a better life. In his navy years and immediately thereafter, Fuchida had drunk heavily, while never permitting the habit to get out of hand. Now, and with remarkably little effort, he gave up hard liquor entirely. He didn't abandon beer and wine, which he considered primarily food drinks. Smoking was more of a battle. In those days, the link between smoking and deadly diseases was not generally recognised, so he had no tangible motive for quitting. The Bible didn't speak against tobacco, not discovered until long after Christ, thus no religious conviction supported him. The only motivation he had was an uneasy feeling that this was an unnecessary self-indulgence, but the craving was so strong that even during church activities he would sneak into the men's room and light up. He persisted in his struggle and gradually freed himself. These efforts were not lost on his family. With joy and relief they saw him change from a dissatisfied, defeated man into one at peace with himself and his environment, gentle and affectionate. But he kept a nostalgic spot in his heart for the days of military glory. To reporters who sought interviews on the 10th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, he said he had lived his finest hour when he led the surprise air attack. But now he saw that his patriotism was a narrow-minded one not to be accepted by the peoples of the world. Today I believe no war could be righteous and prepare the way for peace. Fuchida observed reflectively, I might call myself a pacifist, but I must say that I'm not a pacifist to the nth degree as yet. If for the defence of Japan my service is needed again, I'm ready to answer the call at any moment. This old soldier has not completely faded away. That month brought the Fuchida family another landmark. Haruko was baptised on Christmas Eve 1951, exactly 20 years after she and Fuchida met for the first time in her parents' home. On Easter Sunday 1952, Yoshia and Miyako were baptised. Fuchida's evangelical activities kept him busy well into 1952 and absorbed a large percentage of his income, because he had no source of revenue except the farm. This provided food, but brought in no cash. He had closed out his chicken business when the Korean War started, needing time and energy for his lay ministry. During his absences, relatives and in-laws tended the farm, which relieved him of anxiety. Still, he needed funds for transportation and expenses. His evangelical work paid him almost nothing. Matters, the reading public received his articles well. Some appeared in the magazine Kido Butai, others in Bungay Shunju, Chuokoron and various newspapers. He also wrote two books. One, Task Force, told the story of the Pacific War from midway to the end. It proved quite controversial and brought down on his head the wrath of a number of admirals. This was because he took Yamamoto to task for various mistakes Fuchida attributed to his failure understand air power. In the West, Fuchida is best known as an author for a book he wrote with his friend Masatake Okumiya, Midway, The Battle That Doomed Japan. According to Fuchida, Okumiya did the research and Fuchida did the writing. They were uniquely qualified for this task. Fuchida had witnessed the carrier battle in the Midway area, while Okumiya had been with the diversionary attack against the Aleutians. The largest sum Fuchida received for an article was 400,000 yen, or a little over $1,000 at the time. Although his income as a writer provided a welcome and needed supplement, it was neither steady nor dependable. The farm remained his basic resource. Despite a strict budget, only once during this time did Fuchida seriously think of abandoning evangelism. Temptation presented itself in a most attractive guise. The government offered him a top-level post in the Self-Defense Air Force, soon to be activated. 
With his experience, and by joining at the outset, he could have looked forward to high rank, a regular income, and public prestige. Equally pleasant was the thought of working once more with friends like Gender and returning to a way of life he had loved. More important was another consideration. Did he have the right to refuse to serve when his country called? Fuchida considered the problem long and deeply, then turned down the commission. He would be honoured to serve the new organisation in an advisory capacity, he said, but he believed that he could best serve Japan and humanity by bringing souls to Christ. As the pace of Fuchida's evangelising stepped up, transportation became an acute problem. Accustomed to flight, he found ground travel maddening. Yet commercial air was too expensive and too limited, for he particularly wanted to reach Japan's rural population, scattered far and wide. Evangelism had neglected the farmers and concentrated on the cities. This could be a perfect mission field, about 50 million good country folk, like Fuchida, tillers of the soil. Quite aside from convenience, he longed for his own aircraft. He was practical enough to understand that an airborne preacher would strike a dramatic note and attract a large audience. No doubt a little nostalgia for the sky mixed itself with zeal. He decided a helicopter would suit his purpose best, freeing him from dependence on landing strips. But his finances were such that purchase of a bicycle would have been a strain. A helicopter seemed as far beyond his reach as a private yacht, he nourished the hope and prayed that someday his dream might come true. Aviation had fallen upon evil days in Japan, for a general headquarters order prohibited Japanese from piloting planes. This was another childish act of MacArthur's occupation, snapped Fuchida. In protest, a number of pilots formed an organisation in the Gotanda district of Tokyo. They called it Pilots Without Wings, and not to be outdone in silly gestures, ran up a white flag each morning in front of their headquarters to call attention to the enforced surrender of their livelihood. When the Korean War started, the occupation policy flew out the window. Down came the white flag, and once more Japanese pilots took to the air. This was a step toward the materialization of Fuchida's dream. If a plane should pop up miraculously, he could fly it legally. The phrase, Wings for Christ, flashed across his mind, and he wrote an article using it for the newspaper Asahi. In it, he explained that the airplane ranked with the very best of scientific achievements. So far, however, men had used this magnificent instrument for supremacy in war. If properly utilised, airplanes could help bring mankind to salvation instead of destruction. In California, the Reverend Elmer B. Sachs headed the worldwide Christian missionary army of sky pilots, an organisation he had established on military lines in 1945. Its purpose was to build boys into future leaders of church, home and community. Sachs wanted to set up a branch in Asia, especially Japan, but had no idea how to go about it. Through Ketchum, he heard about Fuchida's conversion and the public impact it had had in Japan. He promptly decided that this Mitsuo Fuchida must be the man destined to lead the sky pilots in Japan. Through a pilot, Bob Hamilton, who crossed the Pacific every nine days on the Korean airlift, Sachs contacted Fuchida by letter. On a certain day in early 1952, Fuchida found it in his mail. Sachs offered him command of the Japanese branch of the Sky Pilots. Inasmuch as Japanese boys and men love and enjoy regimentation, he wrote, we feel that one or two men like you, Building an army for the Lord Jesus Christ in Japan, such as we are building in North, South and Central America, will help to do in one generation a better job for Christ than has been done in previous generations. Fuchida turned back to the envelope and noticed stamped across the top, Wings for Christ. Struck by the coincidence, he was strongly inclined to accept Sachs's offer, but wanted to know more about the sky pilots before committing himself. About two months later, he travelled to Tokyo to visit Bob Hamilton at the Shiba Park Hotel. Hamilton told him that the Sky Pilots operated two aircraft from an airport south of San Francisco. He assured Fuchida that God would provide a plane for him too. Sachs entered into correspondence with Fuchida and urged him to come to the United States, where Fuchida would be more likely to secure the wherewithal to purchase an aircraft than in Japan. The Sky Pilots would pay his transportation costs and other expenses, and give him a small allowance during his stay. Sachs also suggested that he attend the Tokyo Bible Seminary and there learn conversational English. In August 1952, 
Fuchida arranged to stay with Timothy Peach while attending the seminary. His career as a seminarian lasted exactly three days. The study of the Bible there was too liberal, too scientific and too logical, he explained. It attempted to present the miracles in the light of modern scientific thought and theories. This transgressed Fuchida's concept of faith. The sky pilots fretted over his abrupt departure because they wanted him to become reasonably proficient in spoken English before he came to the United States. But Fuchida rationalized that he could always use an interpreter and could give his testimony more convincingly if he didn't have to grope around in a foreign vocabulary. He arranged to travel with Peach aboard a Danish cargo steamer, the Nicoline Mask. He had no written contract, only an informal agreement, and had no idea just what the sky pilots had in mind for him once he reached America. Fuchida and Peach embarked at Yokohama on the 10th of October 1952. After poking around sundry Japanese ports for several days, the ship left Shizuoka on the 16th. Ten days later, it stopped at Vancouver to reload the cargo, then proceeded to San Francisco, docking at 2000 on the 29th of October. Just before leaving Japan, Fuchida had written an article for the Osaka Asahi in which he told readers, Eleven years ago, this November 1952, I headed east across the Pacific aboard Akagi to bomb Pearl Harbor. At that time, I was a brilliant soldier of the Emperor, and I was very uneasy because of all the responsibilities on my shoulders. Now I am again going east across the Pacific to the United States. This time, too, I am a soldier, but a soldier of Christ. This time I have a calm, easy and relaxed feeling, and the desire to be a goodwill ambassador for Christ. Nevertheless, he had some reservations as the ship sailed into San Francisco Bay. After all, he mused, I am the attacker of Pearl Harbor. Perhaps the Americans will hate me. As he stood on deck and saw the magnificent span of the Golden Gate Bridge and the city climbing the hills, he thought that this, truly, was a great country. He resolved that if he ran into unpleasant situations, they would not be of his making. When he left the ship, reporters swarmed about him. Sachs, who had come to meet the ship, fended them off with the customary no comment. But they did take some pictures, and Sachs gave them a brief statement. Obviously, he was accustomed to dealing with newspaper men. The far-off New York Times took note of Fuchida's arrival in a small article datelined San Francisco, 30 October 1952. Captain Mitsuo Fuchida began a life of missionary work today. The slight 50-year-old pilot said his heart was filled with revenge when he led the December 7, 1941, airstrike against the United States Navy, but Christianity has opened my eyes, and I hope through Christ to help the young people of Japan learn a great love for America. After passing through customs, the group proceeded to Sachs's home in San Jose, which was also headquarters of the Sky Pilots. By the time they arrived, the clock hands stood at 23, and Fuchida was glad to retire. The next morning, Sachs handed him a letter from a Mr. Takeji Manabe of Berkeley. This gentleman had learned about Fuchida through the Kirisuto Taishu Shimbun, a monthly printed in Japan and edited by Fuchida's pastor, the Reverend Saito. Manabe wrote that he wanted Fuchida to speak at the Lehman Christian Church in Berkeley at some future date. He enclosed a newspaper clipping, an editorial from Nichi Bay Gigi of San Francisco. It breathed nervous and fear lest Fuchida rock the boat. Already eleven years have passed since Pearl Harbor, and the relationship between Japan and the United States has progressed remarkably. But don't feel too easy. On Pearl Harbor Day each year in the United States, the newspapers write, Remember Pearl Harbor. The editorial went on to say that evidently, Fuchida's work in the United States was of a religious nature. But after all, he had commanded the Pearl Harbor attack pilots. Don't touch the old wound, the writer begged. Don't recall the old memory. According to the editor, all Japanese Americans in California feared Fuchida's coming. He closed by suggesting that the Japanese government be more careful in issuing passports to the United States. Fuchida read this thoughtfully. His feelings as he approached the United States had been those of a new groom about to enter the stall of a powerful horse, uncertain whether the animal would greet him with a friendly whinny or a good swift kick. Now, after scarcely 24 hours in the country, he read this discouraging editorial. The editor of Nichi Bei Gigi had not only written this piece for his own newspaper, 
He had sent it to Japan in his capacity as American correspondent for Asahi. The editorial received wide coverage in Japan, and many Japanese wrote to Fuchida about it. Most of them urged him to return at once and accused the American people of being small-minded. Fuchida had no intention of turning tail and running, nor did he wish to prejudge the United States. Indeed, even as letters from Japan poured in, he made a friend for whom he had the highest respect and affection. After a few days at Sachs's home, Fuchida went to Hollywood to prepare a television program with the famous evangelist Billy Graham. Hearing of Fuchida's arrival in the United States, Graham had asked him to appear on his program Hour of Decision to be broadcast on the 7th of December 1952. Fuchida took an instant liking to Graham, a wonderful man, so sincere and enduring. At this session they were preparing a tape for rerun, hence had no studio audience. Fuchida gave his testimony in Japanese with the young Nisei pastor of the Evergreen Baptist Church, Reverend Eddie Hashimoto, as translator. Then Graham took over, citing Fuchida as an example of how Christ can renovate an individual completely. Fuchida listened in wide-eyed admiration. He himself needed the interplay between speaker and audience for his best efforts. Evidently, Graham required no such stimulus. There was no audience, only the eye of the camera. But oh, how he preached, as though thousands stood before him. His voice, his gestures, his energy. Such power, such conviction. He really was seeing people, although no people were there. The warm sincerity of Graham's welcome helped cancel the impact of the unpleasant editorial. I was so encouraged and inspired from meeting him, Fuchida recounted, his eyes lighting up at the memory. I took new heart. Fuchida's first major engagement was at the big church of the Open Door, in the heart of Los Angeles's business district. The audience, composed mainly of white Americans, filled every seat in the large auditorium. Fuchida could not help wondering how they would receive him, but as he rose he thought only of witnessing. He spoke in his native tongue, with Hashimoto interpreting. When he finished, the people gave him a standing ovation. Someone began to sing a hymn, and the whole group took it up. The force of so many voices spontaneously bursting into a song of praise thrilled Fuchida. This is the token of God's blessing on me and my work, he thought. Sachs followed him on the platform and spoke for some thirty minutes about the Sky Pilots. He explained that Fuchida would become head of the organization in Japan and needed a helicopter to take him to the rural districts. A small hornet cost eight thousand dollars, he said. He asked that the audience produce this sum on the spot. Fuchida felt himself go hot all over. He wanted that aircraft badly, but would have preferred striking the financial note a little more subtly. If the audience resented the appeal, they didn't show it, however. They had already taken up the usual collection. In response to Sacha's plea, they took up another for the Sky Pilots. After the service, the pastor requested Fuchida to stand at the front door with him and greet the congregation as they filed out. Hundreds shook his hand with a kind word of thanks and congratulations. Some even embraced me and kissed my cheek, he said wonderingly. Among those who shook hands was an elderly woman with a boy about eleven years old. She asked Fuchida to accept an envelope from the boy. Smiling his thanks, he pocketed it. When Fuchida and Sachs returned to their hotel, the latter sat down to count the money from the collection. Fuchida opened the envelope the boy had given him. Inside he found a check for twenty-five dollars, earmarked for the helicopter. With the check was a letter that told a sad and dramatic story. The boy's father had been killed during the Pearl Harbor attack. His mother gave birth about a week later, but lacked the strength and the will to recover from childbirth. The woman who had spoken to Fuchida so kindly was the grandmother. Her letter told Fuchida that she and her grandson prayed for him and his work. She was not rich, she wrote, but she wanted to contribute. So would Fuchida accept this check in her grandson's name. She added that she thanked God that Christ had entered the heart of the leader of the Pearl Harbor attackers. Touched, Fuchida prayed silently for the old lady and her grandson. He offered thanks that the Church of the Open Door had received him so openly. Americans must be an open-hearted people with the capacity to forgive, he thought. Thus, his first experience with a large American audience went off better than he had dared hope. He had imagined something like non-committal courtesy interspersed with heckling and crank mail. 
He never expected anything like the outpouring of welcome he received at the Church of the Open Door. The day gave him confidence to face future engagements. When Fuchida rose the next morning, he was troubled. In his heart he had criticised Sachs for his eagerness to take up a special collection, but hadn't he himself? Come to the United States with his hand out, hoping to obtain a helicopter. My wonderful reception in Los Angeles so inspired and gratified me that I no longer thought in terms of a new helicopter, he recalled soberly. I thought only of glorifying Christ, praising him, and serving him. He had ample opportunity to do so. All day, Sachs's telephone rang with calls requesting that Fuchida appear in various churches in the Los Angeles area. By the time they turned in, Sachs had booked his guest solid for ten straight days. He bubbled about the prospects of their tour. He saw in me the opportunity of developing his weak sky pilot organisation and solving his most basic problem, money, said Fuchida realistically. At one of these gatherings, Fuchida encountered someone else with Pearl Harbor ties. After he had given his testimony, a woman rose and asked permission to testify also. She had lost her husband at Pearl Harbor and been almost consumed with hatred of everything Japanese. Now that had all changed. Praise God, she cried, for the attacker of Pearl Harbor has come to our country in the name of Christ. Now I can forgive all things in his name. Another notable incident occurred in Long Beach at a Youth for Christ rally held late in November. At church meetings, Fuchida sat with the minister and other speakers on the platform. This time, however, the gathering met in a movie theatre, and the director had arranged matters along the atrical lines. Fuchida was to wait in the wings until introduced. For one thing, she made the children's school clothes from her husband's old navy uniforms. 18. The Sky Pilots Executive Committee decided that Fuchida should be the Chief Sky Pilot of Japan with the rank of Brigadier General. Sachs, as Commander for the United States and for the overall international organization, held the rank of Four-Star General. He explained that this was as high as the earthly echelon went. Jesus Christ, with five stars, was Commander-in-Chief. Fuchida remarked rather dryly, I never saw Jesus in the picture as a five-star general in the Sky Pilots, although I often saw Sachs as a four-star general. N.A. High Point in his American tour came at the First Baptist Church in San Francisco. This being a Sunday, he and Sachs went together ahead of Dr. Aoki, the translator, who would follow in his car after his own church service. Aoki hadn't appeared by the time the meeting started. The host minister opened the ceremony and the congregation of some 400 sang a hymn. Still no Aoki. Fuchida grew nervous. How could an American congregation understand him without a translator? He surveyed the audience to see if he could spot a Japanese face, or even, rather wildly, anyone who looked as though he or she could translate Japanese into English. With the help of a dictionary, he could read English, albeit with difficulty, and could manage a halting conversation. But to deliver a full course address in English was something else again. What shall I do? he asked himself in dismay. If I speak in Japanese, they won't understand me and the evening will be wasted. So he gathered up his courage. He would try to speak in his broken English rather than disappoint the audience. He prayed fervently, Dear God, give me the words I need to speak. Please endow me, your humble servant, with the gift of tongues as in the old days in the Pentecostal meetings described in the scriptures. His petition finished. He whispered to the agitated Sachs, Don't worry. I'll go ahead and talk English as best I can. At that moment, the minister introduced him. He waited for the cordial patter of applause to settle, then said, This is my first English speaking. I have been United States one month only. I will try make you hear my message your language. As the audience realised what he was attempting to do, they broke into a round of clapping by way of encouragement and a vote of confidence. Fuchida proceeded haltingly, but with conviction. Often during his thirty-minute talk he had to grope for words. At the end the congregation applauded heartily, more in sportsmanlike praise for his effort than for his actual testimony, of which they could have understood little. Later he stood with the minister to greet his audience. Among those who shook his hand was a charming old lady with white hair and a sweet smile. I could not understand your English, she confided, speaking slowly so that Fuchida might comprehend but I could well understand that you love the Lord Jesus Christ. 
From California, Fuchida and Sachs traveled up the west coast of Oregon, speaking everywhere to overflowing congregations. As he sat on the platform at Klamath Falls, waiting for the meeting to start, he began to look through one of the church bulletins. Since arriving in the United States ES, he had been so busy that he'd lost track of time. The date on the bulletin came as a shock, 3 December 1952. Today is my 50th birthday, he whispered to Sachs. As he waited, the highlights of his life passed before him. Isn't it a true wonder that I of all people should be spending the evening of my 50th birthday in a Christian church in the land of my former enemies? He asked himself. Truly, this is the work of the Lord. It can't be explained in any other way. While he mused, Sachs must have spread the word. When Fuchida rose to speak, the congregation jumped to its feet and sang, Happy Birthday. After the service, the pastor invited Fuchida and Sachs to his home, along with some prominent members of the congregation. Someone had hastily rounded up a large cake with fifty candles, and Fuchida found himself the centre of an impromptu party. Sometimes in Japan I celebrated my birthday and sometimes it was forgotten, he said, smiling. But these generous and kind American people celebrated for me as never in my life. We were a big family that night, as Christians should be. We were one body in Christ. His schedule in Oregon carried him to Salem, Jacob de Chaser's hometown. His mother, Miss H.P. Andrus, and other close relatives of de Chaser's came to the First Methodist Church to hear Fushida. After the meeting, they all got together. Naturally, Miss Andrus enjoyed talking about her son to a man who admired him so much. She told Fuchida of a curious psychic experience. One night, she awakened trembling from a terrible dream about being pulled down into a vast darkness. Later, she discovered that at the very moment of her dream, her son was parachuting into China after the Doolittle raid. In Portland, Fuchida found an unexpected link with the past. On Saturday evening, the 6th of December 1952, he testified at a Youth for Christ rally held in one of the big high schools. Afterwards, as he sat on the stage, an usher brought him a note reading something like this. I am sure you are the Captain Fuchida who befriended my mother and me in the Philippines during the war. My mother and stepfather often speak of your kindness and wonder what became of you. You used to call me the little white monkey. Fuchida's mind flew back to that interlude in the midst of war. Eagerly he scanned the audience, but the years had changed his little friend from a child to a woman, and he couldn't recognise her. Unfortunately, her note didn't contain an address or telephone number, and his schedule was too tight for a thorough search. He rather expected her to come to see him after the service or to call at his hotel, but she didn't. Fuchida marvelled that their paths, which had crossed so briefly in the Philippines, should have crossed again in Portland after so many years. A little flurry of disapproval appeared in the press before Fuchida's scheduled appearance in Spokane, Washington. Colonel Clarence A. Orndorff, retired commander of Spokane's 161st National Guard Infantry Regiment, criticised the school board for allowing Fuchida to appear in the auditorium of the Lewis and Clark High School. Sure, this man has repented and has become a Christian, he conceded, but are we to glorify him by use of our public auditoriums, forgetting the miles and miles of white crosses at Pearl Harbor? Reverend William H. Schaffer of the First Brethren Church, who had arranged for the visit, reminded Colonel Orndorff that Fuchida had been under orders at Pearl Harbor, just like the Americans who dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He added pointedly, We pose as a Christian nation, but have we no sense of forgiveness for a repentant enemy? From Spokane, Fuchida and Sachs went to the Bremerton Navy Yard to address a large gathering scheduled for 13 December under the direction of the local Navy chaplain. About 2,000 attended, mostly petty officers, enlisted men and their wives and children. During a break in the program, almost at its close, a woman came forward with her 11-year-old son. She asked the chaplain if he would permit her son to shake hands with Captain Fuchida in full view of the congregation. She wanted to explain why. The chaplain agreed, and the woman turned to the audience. This is the story she told. Her husband had been a first lieutenant, a gunnery officer aboard the battleship Arizona. On the evening of Saturday, the 6th of December 1941, she lay in the Navy hospital at Pearl Harbor expecting her child. Her husband was there when the Japanese attacked the next morning, 
and all personnel visiting the hospital had to hasten to their battle stations, so he raced back to the Arizona. Almost immediately thereafter, the battleship blew up. The labor room shook from the impact just as the baby uttered its first cry. The husband must have died at the very instant his son was born. Today, she finished, in token of Christian brotherhood, I have brought my son to hear Captain Fuchida, and now I want them to shake hands. This touching story and the woman's noble spirit moved Fuchida deeply. He clasped the sturdy little hand while the audience applauded in sympathy and approval. Fuchida and Sachs returned to San Jose for Christmas. In January 1953, they took to the road again, this time traveling through the south, then up the east coast. The route took them through Arizona and New Mexico. From there, they drove across Texas to San Antonio, then north to Fort Worth, Dallas, and Houston. As they chugged along mile after mile, Fuchida would ask, where are we now? And Sachs would answer, still in Texas. Texas, Fuchida thought to himself, is a great empire in itself. Texas stood out in his memory as the scene of his first direct contact with blacks. In particular, he recalled the Sunday morning he spoke in an all-black Baptist church in Dallas to a congregation of 400. His first impression was of warm and friendly people. Above all, they were beautiful singers. It was sing, 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 wonderful deep voices. There was an adult choir and a children's choir, and they could all sing so beautifully. They took up three collections that morning first for their church, then for their missionary fund, and finally for the sky pilots. Sachs never went to a church unless there would be a sky pilot offering, Fuchida recalled. He was all business. On this occasion, Fuchida was surprised to see people making their own change as the basket circulated. They gave what they could afford, without embarrassment and with no false pride or attempt to outdo anyone else. After the service, almost the entire congregation came up to shake Fuchida's hand. Such good Christians, I loved them, said Fuchida. After this experience, Fuchida had a warm spot in his heart for blacks. Passing through the South, he became sensitized to the atmosphere of racial conflict. It seemed to him that the Civil War was still going on. Even in the Christian homes he visited as a guest, segregation was an inescapable fact of life. Being neither white nor black, Fuchida could survey the problem without heat. He held two basic convictions. First, having the same father, all men are brothers. Second, all races should be equal before the law as they are before God. He believed that time was on the side of the blacks, remembering the experience of Japanese on the American West Coast. After a long history of exploitation and prejudice, they had come to be accepted almost everywhere. He didn't think that interracial harmony would come easily. He had been a racist himself. For years he had accepted as axiomatic that the Japanese were a superior people destined to rule all Asia. It had taken a world war, tunning defeat and religious conversion to knock racism out of him. So he knew the United States had a problem, but a problem that could be solved, granted time, patience, give and take, and a sense of Christian brotherhood. Fuchida's first American tour went so rapidly and covered so much territory that he had difficulty sorting out his recollections of the various places. In one eastern town, a police escort accompanied him everywhere. It was just like the President and the Secret Service, he chuckled. I didn't know why this was at first, and in the church where I spoke there were policemen everywhere, at the main entrance, at the side door, near the aisle and the pulpit. After the service, the minister told him the reason. Someone in the town had written him demanding that Fuchida's appearance be cancelled, otherwise the church would be blown up while he was speaking. The would-be assassin must have had second thoughts, for nothing untoward happened. Fuchida found New York spectacular and impressive, but a little of it went a long way with him. New York is too big, too noisy and too gloomy. I much prefer the quiet countryside to live in. In that city, he had a brief meeting with General Doolittle. Fuchida would have relished the opportunity for a personal exchange, but the public nature of the encounter made this impossible. Sachs had arranged it to publicize his sky pilots, and the news media were very much in evidence. Fuchida remembered how courteous and patient the general was with them. Doolittle was a fine Christian, he said. In the Washington, D.C. area, Fuchida stayed several days with Prang. 
During this visit, he spoke at the University of Maryland, the Pentagon, the Navy Annex, and the U.S. Naval Academy. The authorities had arranged a room that could hold a few hundred midshipmen, but a good thousand showed up, so the meeting had to adjourn to larger quarters. This time, the usual program was followed by a brisk question-and-answer period. Fuchida felt right at home with these Navy audiences. He was pleased to discover that the Navy's chief of chaplains had been in the carrier Hornet at the time of the Doolittle raid. While Fuchida and Sachs toured the country, hundreds of letters poured in, some addressed to the sky pilots or to Sachs, some to Fuchida. Many were gracefully written communications from well-educated people. Others were semi-literate scrawls that Fuchida cherished all the more because the money their writers enclosed must have represented a real sacrifice. Some letters expressed hatred or resentment. These saddened Fuchida rather than angering or discouraging him. The one he most vividly recalled was addressed not to him, but to Billy Graham. Graham told Fushida that after their Hour of Decision television tape was broadcast from Hollywood on the 7th of December 1952, he received a letter signed, A Mother Who Lost a Son at Pearl Harbor. As she watched the television show, she had spit on the screen and cried out, You beast! You rat! But Fuchida's favourable letters out ran the critical ones by a hundred to one. Back in California, he took the opportunity to fulfil a personal ambition unconnected with the sky pilots or his religious experience. He asked his associates if he might meet Fleet Admiral Nimitz. In Fuchida's opinion, Nimitz, not MacArthur, was the real American genius of the Pacific War and the Admiral's impeccable conduct aboard the Missouri had convinced Fuchida that Nimitz had a heart to match his brain. Reverend Hiroshi Omi, pastor of the Free Methodist Church in Berkeley, telephoned the Admiral to ask if he would see Fuchida. Nimitz told him by all means to bring Fuchida to his home. As the two drove down the Admiral's street, Fuchida spotted Nimitz standing in his driveway looking around expectantly. He smiled a welcome and called out, Here you are! He ushered his guests into the living room and gave Fuchida a comfortable chair near a window looking out on the Golden Gate. Miss Nimitz was as friendly as her husband. A number of her paintings, some of them Japanese scenes, hung on the walls. Fuchida had dabbled in oils and could recognise good work when he saw it. They were so lovely they made him homesick. Then the Admiral showed them his pet project, an authentic Japanese rock garden of pines and strategically placed stones around a little pond. He made it with his own hands, said Fuchida admiringly. Lovely, not big, but just like in Japan. After dinner, they settled down for a long, leisurely exchange of wartime reminiscences. Nimitz asked Fuchida's advice on how to proceed with an action he had been considering. After the surrender of the combined fleet staff had given up their swords to their American opposites. Accordingly, Nimitz had received Admiral Sumu Toyoda's sword. With the war long over, he wanted to restore the weapon to its original owner. He asked Fuchida if this would be the right thing to do, and if so, how he should go about it. This would be a most considerate gesture, Fuchida replied. I suggest that you arrange to return the sword through our embassy in Washington. Here is a great American admiral, Fuchida thought. He is willing to give back Toyota's sword. Only a big man would do this, a humble gentleman with a good heart. Shortly thereafter, Nimitz returned Toyoda's sword, as Fuchida learned through the Japanese press. The action made a favourable impression on the Japanese people. His estimate of the situation turned out to be correct. A sounding out of the plan in the Honolulu press revealed that such an act would be unpopular, to put it mildly. After about two weeks, Sachs officially withdrew the request, much to Fuchida's relief. This action elicited general approval, expressed in divergent ways. The anti-Fuchida camp was well represented by a letter to the editor of the Honolulu Star Bulletin. It is gratifying to note our shrine at Pearl Harbor will not be blemished. It is mockery to our Christian way of life when this convert, with blood of thousands shed in his greatest hour of triumph, should now seek forgiveness. The same newspaper printed a well-balanced editorial the same day that expressed Fuchida's own sentiments. The Fuchida visit, and the publicity given it, have roused some bitter resentment. To some, his visit to the United States and particularly to Hawaii was an affront. The other point of view is that Fuchida personally was no more to blame for the attack on Pearl Harbor than the Japanese emperor. True, 
Fuchida directed the Great Air Raid on Oahu December 7, 1941, but he did so under orders. These two points of view are irreconcilable at this time, so it is wise that the request has been withdrawn. While this problem was being thrashed out, Fuchida participated in an all-Japanese television program, another mistake in judgment, for it gave the impression that he spoke as a Japanese to Japanese, instead of as a Christian to all Hawaiians. Evidently, too, some people got the idea that in some obscure way he was being honoured for attacking Pearl Harbour. The studio received many letters of protest. Fuchida came in for a thorough panning in the press. A representative letter appeared on the 8th of July. I would like to ask the owner of KGMB-TV just what the purpose was of having, as a guest, the Japanese who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. Perhaps the people on the Japanese program would like to bestow upon him the Congressional Medal of Honor. In my opinion, he took a very active part on a program of mass murder. Fortunately for Fuchida, the virulence of such letters aroused the American sense of fair play. Many hurried into print to protest the protesters. One writer cited the case of St. Paul. No one today harbours any resentment against Paul, or has not forgiven him for his actions prior to becoming a Christian. Can't everyone do likewise for Mr. Fuchida? None of the publicity, favourable or unfavourable, deterred Fuchida from his purpose of evangelising in Hawaii, and he covered most of the main islands. The schedule was much too full. On Molokai, during a meeting with a Chinese group, he fainted from exhaustion. A Japanese doctor invited him to recuperate at Kona, on the big island of Hawaii. He stayed in that beautiful spot for two weeks, until once more able to take the road Fuchida could have done no better for his cause than to be stricken in the line of duty. When the press reported this, public opinion swung in his favour. Hawaiians of all national and racial extractions wrote letters wishing him good luck and a speedy recovery. These considerably lightened his convalescence and his morale. When he boarded the President Cleveland on 12 August to return to Japan, a friendly group came to the pier to wish him Godspeed. In one respect, Fuchida's trip to the United States had been a failure. He had come to find the means of buying a helicopter, and no aircraft had materialised. But very early recognising that this desire was selfish, he had put it behind him. In Japan, the Pocket Testament League had exploited him. This he accepted because it rose from an excess of zeal. He had cooperated gladly, knowing that their aims were identical, and he never lost his respect for his League associates. But Sachs had proved to be a different type. He wanted Fuchida not to stimulate conversions, but to get the sky pilots off at he ground. Once Fuchida had burst out, it seems just like I'm a monkey, and you're the master with a trumpet to make the monkey play to bring in money. I don't like the sky pilots anymore. I'll be a monkey for Christ, but not for you and the sky pilots. Yet he would continue the association for several more years, believing that the idea behind the sky pilots was sound. The Boy Scouts stood as witness that boys enjoyed group activities, wearing a uniform, striving for ideals of social and moral excellence. Add to that the young people's enthusiasm for aviation. It seemed that the sky pilots was a sure winner. When Fuchida had reached the United States membership stood at around 300, when he left it had risen to 3,000. No one could complain that he hadn't pulled his weight, yet the organisation would never realise its potential. Fuchida believed that Sachs lacked leadership, being so obsessed with finances. From a personal standpoint, Fuchida had profited by his tour, to a degree unusual for a foreigner, indeed for many Americans, he penetrated the culture below decks. Visiting mainly small cities and towns, he met the Americans who never made the headlines. He grew more tolerant and appreciative not only of Americans, but of all Westerners. By the same token, in Fuchida, hundreds of Americans met a real Japanese for the first time and had direct experience of their common humanity. Thus, in a small way, he had contributed to better relations between two nations. Almost immediately after Fuchida's return to Japan in early September 1953, invitations began to pile up. He never had to solicit versus speaking engagements. His problem was how to fit them all is. V during September, he stuck close to home in Nara Prefecture, holding 15 meetings with an estimated total attendance of 5,000. Soon he branched out. 
In October, traveling principally in Fukuoka and Shimane prefectures, he addressed 33 audiences and reached over 12,000 listeners. Over the next three years, he would travel all over Japan. It is possible that, caught up in the happy excitement of evangelism, Fuchida did not give his wife due credit for her sacrifice in behalf of his Vanu career. Yoshia believed that during his father's navy years, his preoccupation with a dream house was a great comfort to Haruko, because it seemed to promise a shared future of domestic contentment. Instead, Fuchida's life changed direction rather than style. As a navy officer, he had travelled far and wide for his emperor. Now he travelled for Christ. Newspapers covered his activities, and each speaking engagement led to another. Although he feared a breakdown such as he had experienced on Molokai, he turned down few requests, leaving his health in God's hands. He spoke in all sorts of institutions to anyone who wanted to hear him. He thought that the willingness of Shintoists and Buddhists to open their shrines and temples to him spoke well for their broad-mindedness. He feared that few, if any, Christian churches would do the same. Soon he discovered that his triumph in the United States lessened his popularity in certain Japanese quarters. Those of his own generation enjoyed hearing him and flocked to his lectures. To them he was still the Pearl Harbor leader who personified their hour of victory. But many of the younger set, in particular leftist university students, eyed him askance. They twisted his appreciation of the American people's hospitality into hopeless pro-Americanism. Fuchida found himself a somewhat controversial figure, although nothing could have been further from his mind than propagandizing for the United States or any other country. He vividly recalled an occasion when he spoke at the University of Kyoto. Elated at securing a prominent speaker, the Bible class there advertised the meeting all over the campus, at that time Japan's number one communist academic stronghold. The result could have been expected. No sooner had he mounted the platform than he knew he couldn't deliver his prepared address. The local cell had turned out in full force, and no voice of authority rose to quell them. Hysterical shouts whizzed around him. You are pro-American. You are a spy from the US government. You are in favor of rearmament. We are against US atomic bomb testing. An assembly whipping itself into a frenzy is an ugly sight, but Fuchida felt neither fear nor anger. He looked into their faces with a mixture of impatience and compassion. It was difficult for him to understand what possible appeal communism could have for a Japanese. However, at the moment he faced a challenge to his leadership. He stepped to the edge of the platform and summoned his flight deck voice. Do the majority of the students assembled here wish to continue this meeting? He roared. His voice cut through the clamour and a great calm ensued. If you don't, he continued, then the meeting should be dismissed. But if you want to hold it, then listen to me. The students indicated that they wished him to continue. Obviously, however, they were in no mood to hear a spiritual message. He gave up his prepared lecture and spoke in a calm, business-like manner. Very well, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. After that, I'll continue with my talk. Questions rolled at him right and left. If they were callow, at least they were honest and deserved honest answers. One student asked, are you pro-American? I'm not pro-American and I'm not pro-Soviet Russia, Fuchida replied. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm pro-Christ, and my main topic today is my Christian work in the United States. It was difficult for them to understand spiritual motives. Obsessed with politics, they could think in no other terms. Is America imperialist? They persisted. Won't the United States use Japan as a cat's paw? The United States wants Japan to be in a position to protect herself, he said. It's infinitely better to have US forces in Japan than to have the Soviets here or to have the Japanese communists take over our country. If the communists controlled Japan, in all probability there would be two million young men under arms, and you would be among them. He spoke of the unhappy condition of the nations under communist domination. This is the worst kind of imperialism. You shout youth should not shoulder a rifle, and you cry Yankee, go home. Suppose the Yankees do go home. Suppose the United States withdraws its military forces from Japan before we're ready to protect ourselves. What would happen then? I'll tell you, the communists would take over. Soviet Russia would see to that. Red forces would conquer Japan. A Japanese communist government would rule from Tokyo. 
Once that puppet government came to power, Japan would become a communist armed camp, and you would serve in that camp. You who shout don't shoulder a rifle would shoulder a communist rifle because you would be forced to do so. As he spoke, the students quieted and listened with keen attention. They still asked questions, but in an entirely new spirit. A heckling mob had turned into a discussion session. How about the United States and the atomic tests in the Marshall Islands? I don't like atomic tests either, Fuchida responded. But it is much better that the United States publicly announces to the world that it is carrying on these tests rather than conducting such tests in secret as Soviet Russia does. The Soviet experiments were news to his audience. Some of them asked in shocked dismay, Is what you are telling us about Soviet Russia true? Yes, it is true, he answered, and some day you will know the whole truth. What do you think of the use of the atomic bomb against Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Those bombs were used in wartime, Fuchida pointed out. War is always unfortunate and evil, but once it breaks out, the only way to fight it is all out. That's how both Japan and the United States fought. Now, he emphasized, the war was over, and peace could not come from an attitude and in an atmosphere of resentment and hatred. In time, these things will only bring down other atomic bombs. What about the American occupation of Okinawa? Yes, the United States now occupies Okinawa. But have you ever thought about the Soviet record? Do you know what Soviet Russia did to Japan? In the first place, Russia broke its treaty with Japan. At the very end of the war, Soviet forces attacked our forces in Manchuria. Then they took over all of Sakhalin Island and the Kurils. They occupy them still. What is more, the Soviet Union captured about two million Japanese in Manchuria, and today, after almost ten years of peace, has returned a mere handful. What do you students think of these facts? Then Fuchida's contempt swelled. The truth of the matter is, he thundered, Soviet Russia was the thief at the fire. That expression had a special meaning for Japanese. Their buildings were made of inflammable materials, and fire had always been a dreaded catastrophe. Recovery was possible only by mutual assistance and protection. To the Japanese, a looter at a fire who enriched himself at the expense of his suffering neighbours was the lowest of the low. Fuchida had dared to stand before a leftist audience and apply to the communist homeland the ultimate epithet of disgust. Instinctively, he felt that the moment had come to give them his real message. You cry peace, peace, but is peace actually in your hearts? You can never have peace while your hearts are full of bitterness, hatred and revenge. You can only have peace through the spirit of Christ and through forgiveness. He stressed what Pearl Harbor had meant to Americans, yet he, the Pearl Harbor raider, had been received in a spirit of forgiveness, in a spirit of Christ himself. Then he told the students about some of those who had been kind to him, even though they had lost loved ones at Pearl Harbor. The young men listened intently until he finished, then gave him a good round of applause. A number of them pushed forward to shake his hand. Students and lecturer had reached a point of mutual respect. They gave Fuchida credit for sincerity and courage, while he recognised that they were not hardcore communists who would knowingly sell out their own country to Moscow. In their muddled way, they too wanted a Japan of peace and prosperity. Finally, the president of Kyoto University emerged from his inconspicuous spot in the rear and came forward with congratulations. I have never heard such a brave address, he told Fuchida and he added a bit wistfully, you controlled the students so wonderfully. I'm accustomed to high-spirited young men, Fuchida replied, smiling. At one time I was the Pearl Harbor commander, and today I am a soldier of Christ. He has never failed me, and I will try never to fail him. Fuchida spoke at many universities. Almost invariably he ran into the same initial hostility, although never again so violent. The meetings fell into a pattern as predictable as an old-time Western. A large group of leftist students always attended, apparently with the purpose of heckling Fuchida as a tool of American capitalism. Knowing that any attempt to talk to them along strictly religious lines would be futile, he spoke to them, as at Kyoto, in a political context. In Kyoto, Fuchida had his first encounter with another very different audience, convicts imprisoned for non-violent crimes. Here were thieves, embezzlers, pickpockets, burglars, forgers, confidence men, 
the whole dismal roll-call of man's attempt to secure a livelihood without putting himself to the trouble of working. The city's chief of police had asked Fuchida to address these men. He invited various religious speakers from time to time, and a certain number of convicts always turned out, if only to seize the chance for a break in the deadly boredom of their daily routine. To the surprise of many, a large audience gathered to hear Fuchida. They took nearly thirty minutes settling into their seats, for they shuffled along with a dispirited gait. Always sensitive to atmosphere, Fuchida sensed unwholesomeness, a mental, physical and spiritual desert that he could find no adequate words to express. Never before had he faced such an assortment of human flotsam. Somehow he would have to establish a two thieves, and how he had promised the good thief who acknowledged him as Lord, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. These men soaked up every word of Fuchida's message. On the spot, everyone accepted Christ as his saviour, and, kneeling, asked his pardon for their sins. Then they banded themselves together in the Calvary Club for mutual help and consolation. Later, Fuchida received word from the prison director of how these men went to their deaths. Before, the guards had to drag condemned men to the gallows, he wrote. But the members of the Calvary Club walked to the gallows like men, upright and straight, praying every step of the way, Christ, be with me today in paradise. During the mid-1950s, Fuchida found many Japanese ambivalent about Christianity. They liked its teachings of love, virtue and forgiveness, but disliked the insistence that salvation was only possible through Christ, and many missionaries plunged immediately into the gospel without preparing the way. This Fuchida saw as a spiritual and social error. When I became a farmer, he explained, my primary concern was the improvement of the soil, so that I would not sow seeds in vain. Accordingly, in his evangelism, he started with subjects that would interest his audiences and concepts that would attract them, slowly and gently working Jesus into the picture. I am preparing the soil for a later planting, for seeds, no matter how rich, will not grow on barren soil.